Six, the pale criminal. In the prologue, Zarathustra spoke of types of people who are bridges to the Superman. In the pale criminal, he expands on one of these types. Ye do not mean to slay, ye judges and sacrifices, until the animal hath bowed its head. Lo, the pale criminal hath bowed his head. Out of his eye speaketh the great contempt. Mine ego is something which is to be surpassed. Mine ego is to me the great contempt of man. So speaketh it out of that eye. When he judged himself, that was his supreme moment. Let not the exalted one relapse again into his low estate. There is no salvation for him who thus suffereth from himself, unless it be speedy death. Your slaying, ye judges, shall be pity and not revenge. And in that ye slay, see to it that ye yourselves justify life. The pale criminal is a man who has committed a terrible crime and condemns himself for it. He understands that he did it because his nature is corrupt, and thus he actually condemns man and prepares us for the superman. Zarathustra calls on us to judge him accordingly. He is a proponent of capital punishment, as was Nietzsche, but he wants us to execute him for the right reason. We should not make the mistake of thinking that he is different from us. In his condemnation of his crime, he shows that he is one of us and shares our moral values. His death will bring him salvation from himself, from the life he no longer wants to live. By executing him, we thus join his disgust of man and affirm that man is something that we need to surpass. It is not enough that ye should reconcile with him whom ye slay. Let your sorrow be love to the superman. Thus will ye justify your own survival. Enemy, shall ye say, but not villain. Invalid, shall ye say, but not wretch. Fool, shall ye say, but not sinner. And thou, red judge, if thou would say audibly all thou hast done in thought, then would everyone cry, Away with the nastiness and the virulent reptile. The criminal is like us not just in his moral values, but also in his nature. We should not make the mistake of thinking that his individual nature is corrupt. No, it is the nature of man that is corrupt, and every one of us has malice in our hearts. If we justify his execution by saying that we are ridding society of a monster to protect the good people, we will only keep man in his wretched state. Instead, we should use his case to understand that this is what our nature is like. And it is only chance that made this individual be the one who was driven by this nature to commit an atrocity. By understanding that, we will make the first step towards surpassing our nature and becoming the superman. But one thing is the thought, another thing is the deed, and another thing is the idea of the deed. The wheel of causality doth not roll between them. An idea made this pale man pale, Adequate was he for his deed when he did it, but the idea of it he could not endure when it was done. Evermore did he now see himself as the doer of one deed. Madness, I call this. The exception reversed itself to the rule in him. The streak of chalk bewitcheth the hen. The stroke he struck bewitched his weak reason. Madness after the deed, I call this. Hearken, ye judges, there is another madness besides, and it is before the deed. Ah, ye have not gone deep enough into this soul. Here we get into Nietzsche's stance on the question of free will. Nietzsche did not believe in free will. In his view, our deeds are decided on the unconscious level, and our consciousness merely interprets the deed after the fact. The first conclusion that we must draw from that is that the criminal is not really responsible for his crime. The second conclusion is that what we perceive as the motive of his crime is actually not the thing that made him do it. Zarathustra talks of two forms of madness. One is the madness of after the fact, when the criminal realizes what he did, interprets it wrongly, and thus perceives himself to be a monster. It is right that we execute him, but not because of what he did. We should execute him because that interpretation he gave to his crime is driving him crazy so the execution is necessary to put him out of his misery. The other madness is the one that actually made him do it, and Zarathustra claims that because we interpret the deed wrongly, 
we did not bother to look into the nature of this other madness. Thus speaketh the Red Judge. Why did this criminal commit murder? He meant to rob. I tell you, however, that his soul wanted blood, not booty. He thirsted for the happiness of the knife. But his weak reason understood not this madness, and it persuaded him. What matter about blood? it said. Wishest thou not at least to make booty thereby, or take revenge? And he hearkened unto his weak reason. Like lead lay its words upon him. Thereupon he robbed when he murdered. He did not mean to be ashamed of his madness. And now once more lieth the lead of his guilt upon him, and once more is his weak reason so benumbed, so paralyzed, and so dull. Could he only shake his head, then would his burden roll off? But who shaketh that head? The criminal murdered because he wanted to murder. It is in our nature to revel in blood. But because this is irrational, and man perceived himself to be a rational being, his consciousness had to find justification for it. So he told himself he did it for money, and committed robbery in addition. Now he condemns himself as someone who murdered in the act of theft. Zarathustra argues that if he realized the truth, his conscience would be clear. What is this man? A mass of diseases that reach out into the world through the spirit. There they want to get their prey. What is this man? A coil of wild serpents that are seldom at peace among themselves, so they go forth apart and seek prey in the world. Look at that poor body, what it suffered and craved, the poor soul interpreted to itself. It interpreted it as murderous desire and eagerness for the happiness of the knife. Man, says Arthusa, is not driven by rational forces. He is rather a bundle of irrational drives that rule him. It is implied that man can change and reach inner harmony, but right now he is just chaos and conflict between the drives, and this is why some people commit murderous deeds. Him who now turneth sick, the evil overtaketh, which is now the evil. He seeketh to cause pain with that which causeth him pain, but there have been other ages, and another evil and good. Once was doubt evil, and the will to self. Then the invalid became a heretic or sorcerer, as heretic or sorcerer he suffered, and sought to cause suffering. Zarathustra now introduces a new theme, central to Nietzsche's philosophy. The idea that good and evil are not eternal and fixed, but every culture and every time defines them differently. There was a time, he says, when individualist actions and doubt in the ideals of the herd were considered evil. Those who were skeptic individualists were thus driven to do evil deeds because they could not give positive outlets to these impulses, and they interpreted it to themselves as if they were heretics and sorcerers, two identities that were considered evil. Now that skepticism and individualism are accepted, these impulses are no longer repressed and no longer drive people to do evil. The implication is that if we provide positive outlets to all our other drives, there will be no more evil. But this will not enter your ears. It hurteth your good people, ye tell me. But what doth it matter to me about your good people? Many things in your good people cause me disgust, and verily not their evil. I would that they had a madness by which they succumbed, like this pale criminal. Verily I would that their madness were called truth, or fidelity, or justice, but they have their virtue in order to live long, and in wretched self-complacency. But if we reach a point beyond evil, we will be beyond good as well, because where there are no more evil deeds, there is nothing to distinguish the good deeds. And this is something that scares the people of today, Zarathustra says, because they want to be able to distinguish between good and evil. They want to regard themselves as good. Zarathustra, once again, tells them what he thinks about their current values of good and evil, how they just make them wallow in self-complacency. He would rather they gave expression to their inner drives, those that they define as evil, and find ways to give them positive outlets. I am a railing alongside the torrent. Whoever is able to grasp me may grasp me. Your crutch, however, I am not. 
Thus spake Zarathustra. This closing sentence seems detached from the rest of the chapter. What is Zarathustra saying here, when he says that he is a railing and not a crutch? He means that we are all part of the chaotic torrent, all a bundle of conflicting drives. The crutch is a type of values that help us stand up and function despite this chaos. But this is not what he is offering. He wants us to rise above the chaos, to find a way to direct the drives to outlets that will take us higher. The railing is the type of values that make us rise above the torrent, to a higher level of existence, where the inner drives act in harmony. If we reach up and catch this railing, we might pull ourselves up towards the superman.